We are really honored to have our first speaker, Lance Spitzner, the founder of the Honeyland Project, here with us today. Lance has over 20 years of security experience in cyber threat research, awareness, and training. He invented the concept of honey nets and has published three security books. Lance has worked and presented in over 25 countries and helped over 350 organizations plan, maintain, and measure their security awareness programs. In addition, Lance is a serial tweeter, an avid blogger, and works on numerous community security projects. Before working in information security, Mr. Spitzner served as an armor officer in the Army's Rapid Deployment Force and earned his MBA from the University of Illinois and a great friend for many years. Lance, you're up. How does this work? Thanks, can you, yeah, I'll, I'll let Fides do his magic here. Okay. Right, hey, thanks so much for coming, folks. I really appreciate you a chance to talk. I know we all have some very busy lives, so hopefully we can share some interesting information with you. So as Max mentioned, my name is Lance Spitzer. Uh, I was one of the uh, founders of the Honeyman Project. Uh, now I work at an organization called the Sands Institute. Now for today's talk, you're going to have some of the literally, literally world's best experts in honeypox, deception, RCS. It's going to be a very technical geek fest. So before we do the big dive, I thought it'd be kind of cool and interesting to take a step back and instead of going all tactical and technical, get a little more strategic, get a little bit on the softer skill side. Sometimes as geeks, we get so sucked into the whole side, we forget about the bigger world, the bigger scene. So what I thought would be fun is I'm just going to briefly share some of the lessons learned I've learned in helping build the community projects, volunteer projects, and nonprofit projects like this. And since we're in Texas, I thought for the slides I'd try to go for some like Texas-like look. Or the slide deck. <laughs> we'll see how this pulls it off. So, what are we going to be doing here today? Well, first of all, Max mentioned it very briefly about my background. I'm going to share a lot of lessons learned and three big events in my new life help build these lessons learned. First, words, four years right around in tanks, blowing things up. One of the coolest jobs in the world. Highly recommended the opportunity. Five, six, seven years. Herding cats is pretty much what that job was. Really intelligent, very creative, but cats nonetheless, very difficult to herd. And then finally, uh, for the past six years now, I've been working at the Sands Institute, specifically something called Securing the Human. So my job and passion is actually helping organizations now around the world secure the human element, otherwise known as the human OS. Uh, but once, once again, I've got probably one of the greatest jobs in the world because not only do I work with customers, but community. Once again, I'm a very community-focused job. I've got my title, Director of Community and Outreach. So once again, a lot of uh, lessons learned. Now, one of the key things from these lessons learned is what I'm going to be sharing with you is a lot of my mistakes. I could have called this talk, Don't Do What Lance Did, but that probably would not have been quite as exciting. So as you know, there's a lot of veterans sitting out here, you know, Dave Watson, Max Kilger, Ravi, quite a few other folks. What we do in a group like that is very exciting, but we do make mistakes too. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you is as your career develops, as you grow, uh, don't repeat some of the mistakes. So that's what we're going to be briefly talking about here today. So first of all, why would you ever want to get involved in a community project? By community, I mean volunteer, nonprofit. Because in the open source world we live in, there's a lot of great efforts out there. I mean, you have the Honeynet Project, and then you've got EdMap, OWASP. There's so many others out there. You guys and gals have busy lives, you've got family, you've got social activities, 
you know, maybe you want to work out, maybe you want to do some sports, research, theater, whatever. And then you have your job. You think you want me to dump a lot more work and not get paid for it? Why would I ever want to get involved in anything where I have to volunteer my time and effort? Well, it turns out there's a lot of benefit to you by getting involved in a nonprofit volunteer community effort, something like the Honey Club. First of all, you're going to meet folks that are smarter than you, a lot of folks smarter than you. That's one of the things I love about community projects. So when I got involved in uh, cybersecurity, the whole founding of the Honey Hunt Project was based on, wow, I need people smarter than me. So I need somebody that can reverse malware. I need somebody that can add features to Snort. I need somebody that can decode this data. So it's really cool working with people that are very much smarter than you because they need to learn more. At least I do. I'm always happiest when I'm the dumbest guy in the room. And it happens often. It's not very hard to do. So it's a great way to learn. Another really cool thing, guys, is you develop and work in these communities, you're going to build a network of friends. And trust me, that network of friends it becomes a network of opportunities. Any of the senior uh, honey net folks that are sitting in this room have gotten jobs and opportunities because they know other people. But quite a few startups, awesome. I mean, we, we got folks from that are now in Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Salesforce, all over the place. Startup. I'm just pointing these off the top of my head. Mike Davis and Counterpack, things along those lines. So the bigger, the more people you have, the more community you get involved in. Trust me, the opportunities are there. The next time you're looking for a job, you tap into that network. Awesome. This is, I find, very important for us Americans. Is sometimes it's good for us to get an international perspective. I mean, so the United States, we're a big country. Texas, big country. So what ends up happening is sometimes we forget to see what's happening in the rest of the world. One of my favorite examples is I love traveling internationally because you know, we, the Americans, we always perceive ourselves as the good guys. You know, there's other countries, other places where that may not be the case. So I remember last year when I was in Stavanger, uh, one of the Honey Net events, talking to a bunch of internationals, and somehow the whole talk uh, got started about APT. And there you go, know, APT, and then I being American. Oh, yeah, I know what APT stands for. It stands for China. Because uh, you know, pretty much that's what it's for us. And then the, one of the Norwegians and Citadel Khan doesn't stand for China. APT stands for the American Persistent Threat. <laughs> So what's really neat is as you start working with this international community, you're going to get an international perspective. Folks, we need that, all right? Bad guys don't think like Americans. They all think differently. You need to interact with people that think differently so you can understand this mentality. Also, finally, what's really neat is when you work in these communities, you start making a difference. And that's probably the most exciting thing. And when you start making a difference, you start building a reputation. That is key. So I've got news for you, all right? As, you, as your career grows, and as you start looking at more senior positions, it doesn't matter if it's academia, nonprofit, corporate world, government, or defense. As you get later in life, you are not going to get promoted for your skills. You are not going to get promoted for your reputation. Opportunities and promotions happen because of your reputation. So one of the beautiful things is when you're working in these community projects, you begin building your reputation. And trust me, that is the most valuable thing you have. We are a very small community. Your reputation will take you far, or it will destroy you. So this is a wonderful opportunity to build that reputation. So long story short, one of the key things I have learned in 20 years working in community efforts, and if I has brought this up, but this is my own word. The one thing I've learned is this, is the, the more you give to the community, the more the community gives back. I, it becomes in weird ways. You work on one project, and you really don't get anything, but three years later, you get a job because somebody saw you do that on the project. If you, it's a real long-term investment. So we're all sitting here today. And I was actually talking to Kara about this morning. 
geeks, we're really good at technology, but we're really, really bad at communication. What you don't realize here, though, this is an amazing opportunity. All right? Now, something we're not very comfortable with is breaking out of our shell and just introducing ourselves to other people. Go ahead and introduce yourself to other people here. It's a great way to build a network of community. I know we're not comfortable with it. But you know what happens is a lot of times we stick together. So that table over there, there's the Asian mafia. Another mafia. There's the European mafia. You know, where's the Mexicans? They're all hanging out together. The Germans are normally the Puerto Ricans. What's that? Puerto Ricans? Yeah, who did you? Any problems? Alright, so what ends up happening here is this guy. Let's break out of our show. Just introduce yourself to each other throughout the day. If that doesn't work, we'll pump some booze into you later tonight, and um, that'll definitely help this situation. Or if you're interested, Fias and I were thinking about later today to see We heard there's some good shisha nearby, so folks want to go for shisha later today. If you don't want to drink, then come with us and smoke your brains out. So anyways, like I said though, if you're sitting at this event today, and you go at the end of the day, you go, man, at that event, I really didn't get much out of it. Because you didn't put much into it. It's a little painful, but introduce yourself to other people. People is ultimately the greatest resource you have. Introduce yourself, and the more people you meet today, the more you're going to get out of this. All right, now, this is the big one. Why would I want to actually need these herder cats? Because leading a nonprofit group or getting in any position of leadership is really painful because you are going to do an amazing amount of work. You guys are really, really creative and you're really, really hardworking. You're also a god awful pain in the ass to herd, to manage, because everybody wants to go off and do their own thing. It's what makes people great, but it also makes it very, very painful. Now, one of the biggest challenges in any type of nonprofit community effort, especially in our world, is we can't pay you for what you're worth, all right? Cybersecurity, you know, you know, it's a great job and things like that, so when you're a community, we can't pay the people that are volunteering their time and effort. So how do I motivate them? How do I get them to work? That was my greatest frustration when I was at the Honey Net Project. I'm like, here I am spending five, six, eight years of my life managing bees. I have no budget, I have nothing to pay them. When I go into back into the corporate world, I'm going to be the worst manager in the world because I will never learn how to manage a budget. I will never learn compensation. I am holding myself back. Then I went into the corporate world. And I found I earned more running the Honey Net Project in one year than I did in six years of you know, undergrad and grad school getting on the MBA. And the reason why is this. Yes, your hands are tied behind your back. You do not have money for compensation. You have no leverage. You have no stick uh, to getting people to get things done. But that is a beautiful thing because then you learn, you are forced to really become a good manager, a good leader because you have to tap into the care. How do I motivate? How do I lead people when I can't pay them? So I would argue this. In a nonprofit volunteer community project, you will become a far better leader when you have to go back to the real world where people, you know, where you do control people's pay. Because you will have developed a skill set that nobody else has. I remember once when I left the Honey Net project or was transitioning out and I interviewed at a bank. And they looked at me and they said, You've never managed the budget. You have no experience. We don't want to hire you. And I was like, I just, you know, things like that. And what I learned now is that being in the corporate world, that guy was the biggest idiot because the experience you learn in leading people is invaluable. It's lessons you take on more and more. So how do you lead people when you have no stick, when you have no compensation? Well, what's really neat is this. My job at Securing the Human is changing human behavior. Getting normal computer users, normal end user, to be secure and to change their behavior. Now, how do you change people's behavior? 
Well, it turns out there's a PhD named B.J. Fogg based in actually San Francisco who specializes. And he comes up, came up with this call, B.J. Fogg model. And it turns out that when changing people's behaviors and hurting geeks like you is actually the same thing. So let me show you the model and then how we can apply it to our world. The B.J. Fogg model is very simple. It says B equals M-A-T. In other words, to get somebody to exhibit a behavior, they have to be motivated, the ability, and then there has to be a trigger or prompt. And now what BJ says is so simple, but powerful. The whole idea is the more motivated someone is, the more likely they will do it. The easier something is, the more likely they will do it. Now, let me give you just a security awareness example. And then I'll move this back into our passwords. Passwords, we love to make fun of people and how people use poor or stupid passwords. Every week, I see some blog posts where somebody's done an analysis of crack passwords and bemoan on how stupid, how lame, and just totally insulting the entire user community on passwords. Let's take a step back. The problem with passwords is this. Well, first of all, I'll be reading the article, and these people are like, people aren't motivated to use proper passwords, they're silly, things along those lines. But well, really what happens is this. Take a moment back and think about what we tell people for passwords. It must be 12 characters long. You must have a uppercase letter, lowercase numbers, number, symbol, throw in the blood of a virgin, and change it every 90 days. Oh, and make sure every one of your passwords is unique. So, you know, 100, 150 passwords. Now, we actually think this is simple because this is what we do every day in our life. But it turns out that for the rest of the world, like 99.99% of the world, what we perceive as easy to do is actually really, really hard to do. We have made passwords so confusing for so many people that they don't know what to do. So when they're using weak passwords, it's not their fault. It's our fault because we have failed to make it easy to do. That's why I like the whole thumbprint, you know, fingerprint authentication on the uh, mobile devices, two-step verification, things like that. So in other words, we think it's easy. It's actually really hard. That's why nobody's doing it. That's why I was just talking here earlier that we in the security community need to become better communicators. But that's a different topic. So why am I bringing up this model, though, when it comes to being a leader? Think about it. When you are leading or managing volunteers in whatever type of effort, to really be an effective leader, you just need to do two things. You need to motivate, and you need to enable. That's it. All right. That's what I learned 10 years running the HoneyNet project, but I was never able to put it together to this. If you do these things right, you never have to worry about a stick. You really don't have to worry about compensation or money in the real corporate world, too. So what do I mean by motivation, and what do I mean by ability? Well, let's just take a moment to look at each. So first of all, motivation. What I tend to find is this, is when people first start volunteering for an effort. Hey, I want to join your group, I want to do this or that, they're all excited. But it's hard to maintain that momentum. It's hard to maintain that excitement. They're all involved for you know, three weeks, and then you never hear from them again. So one of the key things is we want to motivate people. And the key, one of the key things I learned from both the Onionet project and my work today in getting people to change behaviors, we grossly overestimate money as a motivator. All right. That's actually a good thing when you're dealing with volunteers. You know, I'll give them a bonus. I'll give them a little bit more pay. I'll give them, you know, a, a, a raise. Instead, recognition. We underestimate the power of recognition as a uh, way to motivate people. So if you're dealing with volunteers, what can I do to get them recognized? 
you know, help them publish a paper, help them present at a conference, help them get an article published in a journal, something along those lines. Or for your employees, when they do a great job, email them, copy their boss, email them, copy the CEO, uh, give them a plaque. Whatever you can do to increase recognition is probably one of the most powerful weapons you have as a leader. And we far too often forget about that. Recognizing people for when they do a good job. Now here's another one where you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. Culture. This is where my work is on big now. But one of the things you try to do is develop a culture where people can have a voice. So here's an example of where I did a big mistake in the HoneyNet project in the early days. It didn't really hurt the culture for a while. Is, remember, culture is what people think, their perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs. So one of the things we did in the early days of the HoneyNet project is we tried to create a policy around intellectual property. You know, you develop something in the HoneyNet project, the HoneyNet project owns the uh, copyright. We did that with the best of intent because we wanted to protect it and ensure that it's open source. And we kind of, uh, the directors at that time, kind of just made the decision and forced it out. Where, of course, it caused an uproar. I'm doing all this work as a volunteer, and you're going to say that you own the uh, copyright? No. And it caused a lot of tension for a while, and eventually it didn't happen. But one of the things I learned, especially when you're working with volunteers, you know, once again, these lessons apply in the workspace. Make sure that people have a voice, that they, you listen. You may not do what they ask or say, but at least they have the opportunity to share their ideas. I am a huge, huge believer of consensus. I believe that if you try to force something on people and they don't want to do it, even if they have to do it, it's not going to get done. Same for the work world. So I always try to get consensus, feedback, input, and this builds a very positive culture. Now, I really also believe in helping build people's uh, reputation, exposure. Do whatever you can to help them get recognition, not just within the organization, but outside the organization. So, you know, a big part of the Huntington Project is developing tools, writing papers. We want to get these people exposure because you're helping them. The more you can help them, the more they love you. And then really enable people to grow and learn from others. That's what this is all about. Like I said, I can't force you to talk and learn from other people. But uh, hopefully you will take advantage of that. And by the way, all the old crusty honey nut folks that are sitting around here, you know, Christian and stuff like that, feel free to jump in. <laughs> these guys have all sorts of stories. A lot of them I don't know because I wasn't there or I wasn't sober. But <laughs> we won't know. So the key thing I learned, this is actually a bit of advice I got from Jenny, is uh, this right here. Remind people that they are making a difference and that you really appreciate it. Just whenever they do something big, just send them an email with that one sentence. And you will be astounded at what type of feedback you get, the culture this helps build, things like that. That one sentence, and you copy that person's boss, that one sentence with their boss copy is far more than you know, any type of raise or bonus or anything you can get. So this is one of the key things I learned at the Uninet Project with my hands tied behind my back. I can get people recognition and let them know they're making a difference. And you appreciate that. You can move mountains. Very, it's, it's just shockingly powerful. So one of the neat things that we did with the HoneyNet project, and uh, I just mentioned, is we would, uh, especially in the early days, we were one of the first people doing very certain research, and we would be invited to literally travel all over the world. So this is when we presented at CESG. Uh, that's the uh, British version of the NSA, CIA. And to say, I got to print it, I'll let you know. And yeah. So this is where we presented at the donut. And you can see uh, Dave Watson's smiling face right up there. You can see he hasn't changed a bit. Um, 
so that was a real fun one. So we got to go pre uh, present to a bunch of British spooks. And I learned, by the way, British spooks are far cooler than the American spooks. They're more laid back, they're more social, things like that. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, funny story, you know, every trip has like 100 funny stories. One of the funny stories from this one is this was going to be, uh, uh, we were going to the UK. So we signed a contract with the British government about six months before going out to uh, the events. They just, the British government said, honey, if you're doing great stuff, fly as many guys as you can to teach us everything you're doing. So we signed a contract with them, like, well, that's okay, just as long as you pay the expenses. And the contract said something like, you know, okay, we're going to pay all your expenses, we're just going to give you a lump sum, 15,000 British pounds, 20,000 British pounds, to pay for everybody's flights and hotel, because we calculated that's how much it would be. And then during the six months between, you know, when we signed the contract, we were going to go out there, the American dollar crashed. So in other words, because when we were paying us in British pounds, we went out there and we had like 10,000 extra American dollars. So we get out to, you know, we get out to the UK and we're like, dude, we got like five, ten thousand extra dollars. What do you guys want to do? Hardware, shirts? They're like, boobs. <laughs> so literally, we spent about five thousand dollars all on boobs for a week. But yeah, I mean, I asked the guys, they can tell you all sorts of fun stories from that one. So, but like I said, it, it, it's investing in, what I call it, like it's with some of my uh, army experience, you know, taking care of the troops, invest in the troops. Oh, one of the many things I learned in the army is probably take care of your troops, and your troops will take care of you. I got funny stories about that one. So remember, the BJ Fogg model. Really, we had two things, motivation and ability. That's the two key things to leading, uh, not you know, community efforts, but just leading in general. So one of the things I learned quickly is give people the resources they need. So at the Honey Net Project, when we first got funded, I, what I would do is I would like pay people to develop this or develop that. And that just did not. Because they're like, well, this is me, my job, you're really not paying me enough. And things. So that was an epic fail. Volunteer work. Never pay people for their time, especially in our world, because you can't come close to what they're worth. So one of the things I learned instead is the resources. So for example, all right, most of you are geeks, and most geeks love to code. And one of the greatest things we're the good at at the Honeynet Project is developing tools. Where you guys suck at is documentation, all right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if, you know, we paid a technical writer to do the documentation for you? So in other words, develop your tools, and you don't have to worry about the documentation. We'll have somebody do the documentation for you. Or you need a laptop, all right? And we have people in you know, some countries where they didn't have a lot of money. Here's a laptop. We'll get you a laptop so you can get stuff done. Or do you need some coding software? Do you need a cloud platform? So Ron Dodge is not here, but one of the neat things Ron Dodge did for a lot of other project members is give them access to all the Microsoft uh, development software. So they can uh, do all the coding suite. So the, what I learned is don't focus on compensation. Focus on what can I do to enable you to do your job better? And remove blockers, all right? So the whole I is about common sense, but you know, what's their pain point, you know? Things like, you know, Lance, my bandwidth stinks, I can't upload this code. How about we just pay for your internet, so you have good internet, just coming up with those things. Just, uh, I very much not a micromanager, and you especially can't do that in this whole world that we exist in. Just let good people good, do good things. How I learned the whole micro of uh, that is in the Army. I'll never forget, I was in officer school. One of my first days in officer school is I had to lead an eight-man team, an infantry team, I had to lead eight people. And I was like, they said, you're in charge, lead this eight-man team. And so I started running around to each one of the eight individuals. You stand here, you do this. You stand here, you do this. And then the commanding officer that was training us said, stop, you're an idiot, you're doing it all wrong. That is not how you lead people. Let me show you how you lead people. You have eight people. You have two team leaders. Each team leader is in charge of four people. Go to team leader A. Team leader A, you're in charge of these people. Team leader B, you're in charge of these people. Team leaders, let's move out and just go. Let them do their job. 
you worry about where you're going. So one, people will tell you I am a master delegator. The beauty there is just let people do their things and gives you time to do what you need. Um, and then, like I said, a lot of times we want to learn new skills. Connect people with the skills. Do they need training? Do they need to meet someone? Can they be training online, do it on site? So the key thing I've learned is on ability, don't spend that money in compensation. Do what you can make their job easier. And here's a key thing. If you don't know what's slowing them down, if you don't know what they need, ask. Just simply ask, hey, what can you do that would make your job easier, better, faster? So like I said, in the Honeynet Project world, we try to get people soft. We learn our lessons. We'll pay them, give them software, give them hardware, give them tools, whatever they need to get their job done. So here's one of the neat examples of how uh, we did that. One of the things I do in Security Union is I build a community of security awareness officers. Though they're not part of all, some are customers, some are not. It's about 800, 900. And we had a mail list. And we are all sharing lessons learned on mail list, how to secure people. The mail list didn't scale. And all everybody was telling me, Lance, we need a better way to communicate. We need to be able to search past postings, share files. We need to search members. I want to know what other security awareness officers you know, live in the Netherlands, or live in Poland, or live in China. Or I need to know what specialized I see. Long story short, I was like, okay, hey, I feel your pain. This is hard sharing information. Let's make it easy. So uh, we developed a site. Um, this is actually developed by Forum. It's awesome. If you're looking for a community uh, cloud-based solution for people to share all sorts of different topics, this forum.com, highly recommend them. It's like a thousand bucks for a year. And now, super active, 20, 30, 40 posts every day, all these volunteers sharing information on how they're securing the world. So all, every country, every industry, all the big game players are on here. And by, all I did is I listened to their pay, pay points and invest a very small amount of money to make it easier for them to communicate, and now we're reaping deep benefits. So it's, this is really how I've learned how to accelerate. So I notice I've only got a couple minutes left. Got to see those work, though. So what's going to happen? Oh, I have three minutes left. Perfect. Last slide. So what ends up happening? Join the community. Doesn't have to be any end project. Really, I mean, doesn't have to be a cybersecurity world. Follow your passion. You're going to get so much out of it. If you can't find one, well then just uh, contribute to the community in general. I started with white papers. So the very, very first white paper I ever wrote and published, just randomly on the internet, was called To, called to Build a Honeypot. This was like 98, 99. And I got a lot of people right away just finding what an idiot I was. All right? So I go, sometimes when you're, be, be prepared for negative feedback, you know, just keep in mind, if you want to make a difference, Sometimes you gotta be different. Uh, now the big thing about community stuff though is it does take a lot of work. Uh, especially if you're meeting people. Sometimes it feels like you're doing 90% of the work and only getting 10% of the recognition. That comes with the territory, all right? Especially when you're meeting volunteers. And part it takes time. Don't think you're gonna start building a reputation and really get out there in six months. It will take years. But like I said, it is worth it because like long term, it's not your skills, it's not your experience, it's your reputation. So with that said, if nothing else, be sure to take advantage of this opportunity today. Network, learn, push yourself, push yourself out of your comfort box, especially the Asians. I know Asians, sometimes it's a little hard. And the polls, polls are really bad at being social also. All right, Germans, you can't get them to shut up, so don't worry about that. You'll meet the Germans. Otherwise, thank you so much, and uh, good luck.